honoured guests, friends and colleagues. It's a huge privilege to be invited to deliver this Oxford London lecture this year. And it's lovely to have so many of you here to discuss the really important questions about how we're going to improve the nation's diet. I know that many of you have a professional interest in food, whether as researchers or health professionals. We've got people here from the food industry, and there are representatives from local and nationally, national policy makers. We may have some divergent views, but what's certainly true is that we all share a personal interest in food. And that's what makes this such a compelling but sometimes a very contentious topic too. Last week, I met up with one of my former PhD students. We went out to dinner. We chatted about the latest nutrition news and we ordered food. Now, we both have abundant knowledge on calories and fat and sugar, and we independently ordered the dish of the day, prominently advertised on a special board we'd be nudged into a choice. But I have no confidence whatsoever that that was a nudge from a chef who was concerned for our health. In all probability, it was a purely commercial nudge. Now, that would not be a problem if it were not for the fact that a poor diet is the leading modifiable cause of ill health in the UK. That's not just the grandiose statement of a nutrition evangelist, it's the verdict from the Global Burden of Disease study. This found that over 12% of the ill health in Britain was attributable to dietary risk factors. And if we add in the risk from overweight too, it's about 20%. Now obesity is the lightning rod in the discourse about diet. But I need to say that it's not the only issue we face. Tonight, I'm going to put aside some of the important micronutrient issues, things like folic acid or vitamin D, and in a global context, deficiencies of iron or vitamin A. Instead, what I want to do is to focus on the dietary risk factors for non-communicable diseases, which at a population level, I think it's fair to say, are now pretty well described. The fact is that on average in the UK, we eat too many calories, too much saturated fat, sugar and salt, and too little fiber. Now we have dietary goals for each of these. And my colleagues in Oxford, Pete Scarborough and Mike Rayner, have done the analysis which shows that if we were to achieve the population targets for a healthy diet, we could save more than 33,000 premature deaths every single year. The problem is that we've had these goals for many decades now, but in recent years, the changes that we have seen have been very modest indeed. The time has come to step up our action. Public confusion about the messages, I have to say, really doesn't help. Witness the latest debate, which pitches fat against sugar when the science tells us clearly that both of these are of concern. I think that one of the problems is that while nutrition science and our understanding of the metabolic consequences of food is mostly conducted at the level of individual nutrients, protein, fat, and carbohydrate, and so forth, when it comes to translating those recommendations into guidance to the public about what we should eat, I think it's probably quite important that we start to talk about foods rather than nutrients. Meat, fish, vegetables, even biscuits and crisps. That's not to suggest that we divide into foods which are allowed or not allowed. It's about understanding the overall dietary pattern and the relative proportions of different food groups. Perhaps some of you, like me, when you're in the supermarket, scan the trolleys at the till and use some kind of personal algorithm to classify the healthy and the not so healthy. Well, in my research group, we've tried to do that in a slightly more scientific way, using a statistical approach to derive dietary patterns. And we've then tested the association with obesity. 
So here you see our data, which is based on the ALSPAC study of children in Bristol. It's an important data set because it has very detailed measurements of diet made throughout childhood and adolescence, and also measurements of children's weight and fatness. What we've done is to identify a particular dietary pattern which is characterized by being high in fat and sugar. And we've then related that dietary pattern to changes in weight. So very briefly, each child is given a score, and the more closely a child's diet adheres to that empirical dietary pattern, high in fat, high in sugar, the greater the risk of weight gain. It's expressed in this graph as the BMI Z score. That's a statistical adjustment which recognizes that children's BMI changes naturally during growth and development. But what you can see is the children in the top quintile gain weight the fastest. Or to put this into more everyday terms, those in the top quintile, the top 20%, whose diet most closely matches this high fat, high sugar pattern, these children have an 18% increased risk of becoming obese compared to those in the lowest quintile. If we now look more closely at what these children are actually eating in terms of foods, we can see that this so-called obesogenic dietary pattern is characterized by higher than average intakes of confectionery, cakes and biscuits, sugary drinks, white bread and crisps, together with lower than average intakes of fresh fruit and vegetables. Now, I can hear some of you thinking that that doesn't really sound like rocket science. But actually, what is important is that this is empirical data which gives us very clear evidence on the basis of food groups, which we can now use as the basis of advice to parents and as the focus for policy action. Now, in the short time we've got this evening, I don't want to dwell too much on the source of the problem. What I want to do is to try to focus on possible solutions. The chief exec of the NHS, Simon Stevens, in his five-year forward look, made a powerful case for the need to prevent disease if we're going to improve health and well-being of individuals, and indeed, if we want to ensure the future viability of the NHS and our economy. But despite widespread acceptance of that mantra, prevention is better than cure, prevention remains the Cinderella of medicine. There has and continues to be chronic underinvestment in preventative health research. It currently represents just 2.5% of the total health research budget of the 11 major funders. Moreover, when it comes to intervention, we find it really hard to withhold resources from new drugs to treat life-threatening diseases in order to reprioritize our investment into prevention, even if objective measures tell us that the health impact associated with prevention would be greater. The fact is, none of us want to have to make those trade-offs, but we cannot afford to do everything. The shift we need to make in our approach to healthcare is absolutely fundamental. Now, that's a big ask at any time, but none the more so than in the prevailing economic circumstances. But it's also all the more reason why we need to invest in preventative research, because we need to identify the most effective interventions. We need to do that to have confidence that our investment now will pay dividends in terms of reductions in ill health in the future. Now, our ambivalence about intervention is not just a dilemma about resource management. The fact is we're conflicted about the nature of many interventions, and that really brings me to the crux of my comments today. If we accept the case that diet is crucial to enhance disease prevention, then how are we going to change eating habits? Knowledge, nudge, or nanny? I often hear it said that eating is a voluntary behavior. We choose what to put into our mouths. Yet while we're very good at telling those people over there what they should eat, 
The fact is, we are surprisingly poor at putting that knowledge into practice ourselves. Most people do know that fruit and veg are good for you and sweets are not. Yet that knowledge doesn't easily translate into behavior change. I recognize this problem very well myself. I could stand here and probably give you a pretty coherent lecture on physical activity and the benefits to health. But that knowledge does not get me out of bed in the morning to go for a run. Although we like to think of ourselves as rational, intelligent people who make good decisions, research shows us that much of our behavior in relation to food is not a conscious, deliberative act. Instead, it's an automatic response. It's shaped by the environment in which we find ourselves and the social cues that surround us. As my colleagues know, if you offer me a biscuit in a meeting, I'll usually eat it. Yet I don't go out in search of a biscuit mid-morning if I'm working in the office on my own. So the question is, if we restructure the environment, can we nudge the nation to better health? But why stop there? Paternalists will argue that we could quickly make progress towards a healthier diet if we'd simply adopted more draconian policies. Look at the success of wartime rationing, they argue. People were much healthier, social inequalities narrowed. But in 21st century Britain, how far are we prepared to compromise personal or commercial freedoms to benefit society at large? This is a discussion which is not just one for scientists, it's for everyone. The Nuffield Council sought to encourage a public conversation about these matters and to move towards a framework to help us make these dis difficult decisions in matters relating to public health. Their ladder of intervention set out a principle of libertarian paternalism, sticking to the lowest rung of the ladder to achieve the necessary effect, and reasoning that higher rungs which are associated with increasing infringement of personal autonomy really have to be justified by the magnitude of the risk, the likely effectiveness of the policy, and perhaps also by the failure of less intrusive policies. So it starts with surveillance and monitoring, progresses through information and education, the knowledge-based solutions, and on to so-called nudge interventions changing the default and guiding while not eliminating choice. And finally, on the upper rungs of the ladder, there are actions which restrict or eliminate choice. I have to say these are interventions which are almost certain to attract the byline nanny state in much of the media. Now, in the case of tobacco control, which is a much more established policy area, we can point to a whole portfolio of actions which stretch right across this ladder of intervention. We've got educational campaigns to encourage people to quit smoking. We've got restrictions on advertising tobacco products, taxation, bans on smoking in public places, and now plain pack packaging of cigarettes. These are all an accepted part of the policy scene, a mixture of knowledge, nudge, and nanny. There's also another lesson from tobacco control policies, and that's the importance of treatment options to support individuals to change their behavior. And I think we need to learn from this when it comes to obesity. That might at first seem a strange call for somebody who's very focused on prevention. But the fact is that treating obesity is about preventing diabetes and other serious diseases just as we treat high blood pressure to prevent strokes and heart attacks. The problem we have in treating obesity is that there is disproportionate pessimism about the effectiveness of weight loss programs. All too often, we think it's too difficult to treat obesity. Yet the fact is, we have clear evidence of effective interventions. They range right from bariatric surgery through behavioral weight management services, or even self-help programs. Here's just one piece of data from an intensive behavioral intervention study among people who showed early signs of developing diabetes. As we see in the top panel, 
The intervention led to an initial weight loss of about seven kilos, which reduced to just four kilos after four years. While in the bottom panel we see that even this pretty modest reduction in body weight substantially cut the progression to diabetes. In fact, it slashed the rates by more than 50% in the first four years. Four kilo weight loss for a 50% reduction in diabetes. The challenge we have is to deliver this kind of intervention as part of routine care and at a scale where we can achieve real public health impact. I think we can do that too. This is data from our own study, which compares obesity treatment by a practice nurse with referral to a commercial service. What we can see is significant weight loss over one year in both groups. And in this case at least, we see greater weight loss in the cheaper service, referral to a commercial provider. Nowadays, most smokers who visit their doctor will be offered a referral to smoking cessation services. Indeed, we incentivize GPs to do so through the performance-related component of their pay. Yet at present, most people who would benefit from weight loss services are not even encouraged to lose weight, let alone offered support to do so. Unfortunately, I think a false dichotomy is sometimes drawn between this kind of individual approach and the more population level approaches. I try to do both of these, and I think this cartoon neatly summarizes the way I approach my work. My research is very focused on identifying and testing strategies to enable people to manage their diet in the circumstances in which they find themselves today where food's abundant, palatable, convenient, and pretty cheap. Effectively, we're trying to help people push the boulder up the hill. But at a policy level, I recognize that we need a fundamental shift to change the environment in which we live, to make the hill a bit less steep, if you like, so healthy eating doesn't feel like asking people to take up some kind of extreme sport. The population level approach falls neatly into four Ps, people, products, promotions, and places. To date, the mainstay of policy has been a focus on people, and mostly, in fact, on education. We've tended to encourage people to take greater personal responsibility for their food choices. Recently, there has been more use made of social marketing techniques. Here, that we try to identify key audiences, such as in the Change for Life campaign, which has really focused on low-income and deprived communities. Change for Life has tried to move beyond basic education to use other behavioral techniques, goal-setting, self-monitoring, providing some feedback, and in some cases, even offering incentives. They've tried to gather data on behavior change. And what we see is that accompanying the campaign last January around sugary drinks, there was an 8% reduction in sales of sugary drinks at that time. And during the summer shake-up campaign, there was an increase of about five minutes per child per day in physical activity. These are small effects, I know. But like the early tobacco campaigns, this broad awareness raising about the need to change is likely to be an important prerequisite in building public understanding and indeed beginning to develop some consumer acceptance of the need for further intervention. But more specifically, people need to be able to put their knowledge into action. And to do that, we need to know what's in our food which brings me to the subject of nutritional labeling. I'm pleased to say that about two thirds of packaged products in the UK now have color coded nutritional information on the front of pack, which gives an easy at a glance guide to calories, fat, saturated fat, sugar, and salt. This is a really important stepping stone to healthier choices, but it's not a panacea. Our Cochrane review has shown that nutritional labeling alone actually has rather small effects on consumer behavior. 
But I think we have to hope that as knowledge builds, more people will use this information. And in addition, I think there's real potential for actually much bigger impacts on business practice because we know that these nutritional criteria are being built into the research and development plans within companies. And that leads me to the second P, products. So as chair of the Responsibility Deal Food Network, I've been closely involved in negotiating voluntary agreements with industry to cut fat, saturated fat, sugar, and salt. The UK, for sure, is a world leader in this area, and we've seen some really important changes. The challenge in transforming products is to maximize progress whilst retaining customers. The equivalent, as one chief exec told me, of rewiring the jumbo jet whilst you're crossing the Atlantic. It's not in anyone's interest if customers abandon the more progressive brands who are renovating their products in favor of those who are unwilling to change, as happened in the early days of the salt reduction program. Fortunately, we've learned from that, and a large proportion of the success has now been delivered through a health by stealth agenda. Mind you, that is easier for salt than it is for calories. Of course, it's possible to cut the fat and sugar in some products, but there's a limit to what reformulation can technically achieve or what's acceptable to customers. If the goal is to cut calories, a more appropriate option in many cases will be to reduce portion size. This, of course, cuts fat and sugar at the same time. So because we like our Twix just the way it tastes, the compromise is that they're now that little bit smaller. It's a way of retaining the authentic taste of foods like chocolate, but reducing the risk of overconsumption. In fact, we've seen really important cuts in the size of most single, single bars of confectionery, with the top three manufacturers introducing a 250 calorie cap on single serves of confectionery. And we've also seen an introduction of smaller can sizes by some soft drink manufacturers. Our research has shown that these small cuts in portion size can lead to day-long reductions in energy intake and may be sufficient to offset the trend towards weight gain. It's also important, I think, because these reductions in portion size are the first small steps to starting to turn the tide on the supersized culture. But there is a huge challenge, and I've seen at first hand the question of public acceptability of this kind of change, which the food industry have made in direct response to our calls for improvements in, uh, in products. There are cases, for example, digestives have reverted back to their old recipe because of customer complaints when the saturated fat content was reduced. And the reductions in portion size have been greeted with cries of overcharging or excessive interference in the market. It's really easy for campaigners to call for mandatory portion sizes, but do we really want government deciding how big should a biscuit be? I suspect not. There's also, I think, a reluctance on the part of some companies to make this kind of change solely for the UK market. Change is expensive, and the fact is the UK is a relatively small player in global terms for many brands. We need to marshal a much stronger global agenda and alliance to build change if we're going to carry forward any momentum in renovating products. The UK, with its track record in this area and the very vocal public health community, I think could be taking a much stronger global leadership role in this area. On to my third P, promotions. And I have to say that here the situation starts to look a little bit less rosy. One area where the responsibility deal has tried but failed to deliver collective action relates to promotions. This goes to the heart of business competitiveness 
and frankly, it doesn't easily lend itself to voluntary action. We probably need a level playing field, which may require legislative change. But the challenge I think there is for public health research is to crystallize the nature of the marketing restrictions which are likely to be the most effective. Take, for example, the case of the multi-buy ban on alcohol in Scotland. Now, at first sight, this seems a really important policy to cut alcohol consumption. But this analysis by my colleagues in the Behaviour and Health Research Unit in Cambridge shows a different story. So the solid blue line is the sales in Scotland where the ban was implemented, and the red dotted line is the sales in England where it was not. The solid vertical is the date that the multi-buy ban was introduced, the end of two-for-one promotions and so forth. Let's focus just on total alcohol sales. And the fact is, you don't need me to give you any statistical analysis here. These lines are almost coincident. Sales in the year post-ban were virtually identical in both countries to that the previous year. Now, I'm a co-investigator in the Behaviour and Health Research Unit, and this is just one part of our research about how the in-store environment can shape choices. Surveys tell us that more than 80% of customers say they want to eat more healthily. Yet that's not immediately apparent to me when I go shopping. Something happens to our good intentions whilst we're in the store. Here's our data which looks at the effect of product placement at the end of aisles. These are the so-called gondola ends, the coveted spots for manufacturers where footfall is greatest and where there are very few competing products. In our analysis of sales of beverages, we showed that the uplift you get in sales from positioning at the end of aisles was equivalent to a 4% price discount on beer and a 22% price discount on soft drinks. The fact is that these in-store promotional tactics, combined with marketing beyond the supermarket doors, act as powerful incentives for people to purchase. They shape consumer choice. It seems very plausible to me that we could seek to reduce these nudges to overconsumption, but there's an outstanding question as to whether we can use similar nudges to secure a positive shift towards healthier items. Let me briefly consider now the fourth P, place. I've talked a bit about supermarkets already, but what about the local community environments more generally? The fact is, food is more available than ever before. There was a time when we used to talk about food deserts, where it was hard to access food. Now, that may still be the case in relation to fresh produce in some communities, but actually, for the most part, we live in a food jungle. Food is all around us, vending machines offering food 24-7, and some high streets which are so crammed with chicken shacks and kebab vans. And the problem is they then compete to sell the most food the most cheaply. This is having a huge impact. Survey data shows there's a clear correlation between the density of fast food outlets and the average level of deprivation in an area which we know is also linked to an increased risk of obesity. And a recent analysis has looked more specifically at the lifestyles of individuals, and it's shown that those who are most exposed to takeaway outlets around home and work environments are almost twice as likely to be obese as those who encountered the fewest outlets. Now, these are associations. They're not necessarily evidence of causality, but interestingly, this is one area where there does seem to be a public appetite for change. For example, we've seen some local authorities who've used planning laws to introduce zoning policies to control the density of food outlets, particularly uh, close to schools. In fact, I think we can consider schools to be a special place where children deserve additional protection. And the fact is that in schools, we've gone right to the top of the Nuffield ladder. 
We've defined mandatory standards for the food which is provided, including a complete ban on sugary drinks and confectionery. So I've shown you a little of what's happening, my usual glass half full perspective, but I also need you to see what is not happening too, the half empty glass. The fact is that food policy is patchy and inconsistent. That's true even within just the health domain, never mind if we think of the broader agenda on food or indeed alcohol, but that's a whole other lecture. But what do we need to do in terms of health? Well, I think we need more consistency in the messages to consumers, and we need far more support from health professionals to help people change their diet. On product reformulation, companies are renovating some, but not all of their products. And in general, the out-of-home sector is lagging behind the food we buy to eat at home. Far too many local food outlets have yet to start offering any healthy options. Perhaps we need a scheme like the Scores on the Doors hygiene ratings to help customers identify outlets which are at least striving for better standards around nutrition. We recognise the impact of food advertising on food choices, yet we only restrict television advertisements within a very small fraction of viewing hours. And we take very little account of the many other forms of advertisements, whether it's cartoon characters on pack or sponsorship of sports and the arts by companies offering foods high in fat, sugar and salt. We set standards for food in schools, but we do very little to control food provision in other public institutions. My personal bugbear is hospitals. Hospitals are a workplace for 1.4 million people and a setting which surely ought to be a flagship for the public health principles of preventative medicine. Yet in hospital concourses, we see them full of fast food chains, minimal access to fresh fruit and vegetables, and frequently no provision for food out of hours, except from vending machines stocked with crisps and confectionery. This is short-term thinking. Income today at the expense of healthcare bills tomorrow. One area where it's particularly hard to deny the evidence case for action is tax. Tax is an established part of alcohol and tobacco control policies. And perhaps belatedly, a number of countries are introducing health-related taxes on food, especially on sugary drinks. Sugary drinks are an easily defined category with very specific health harms. Previously, this policy has ba been based almost entirely on economic modelling and has relied on assumptions about the price elasticities. But more recently, we've seen some empirical evidence of effectiveness. So, a 10% tax on sugary drinks in Mexico has led to a roughly 10% decrease in the sales of these products. Despite the professional support for such a policy, my guess is that political reticence that we see in Britain from both the major parties is born out of an anxiety about public opinion. Tax is an unpalatable concept, but given the scale of diet-related ill health facing us, can we afford not to consider this option? A tax on sugary drinks would give customers a clear choice at the point of sale and would perhaps encourage more customers to switch to the no sugar options. As the five-year NHS Forward Look notes, as the nation's waistline keeps piling on the pounds, we're piling on billions of pounds in future taxes just to pay for preventable illnesses. Prioritizing prevention means a fresh look at how we judge the true costs of our food and indeed how we invest in healthcare. So to summarize, education's necessary, but it's clear from the limited progress to date that it's insufficient. And in the short term, it may even be contributing to widening inequalities. Our eating habits are shaped by the food environment and we can and should seek to redress the many nudges towards an unhealthy diet. 
but the evidence of effectiveness for healthy nudges is still scant. So we need to do more, but what? A key assumption of modern politics is that we should be free to live as we like without being nagged. Yet the fact is that most of us choose to set rules about food for ourselves or our families. Not eating while you're at the computer, for example, is one which exists in my house. So might we also accept our agents, in this case government, setting rules on our behalf, especially where they're consistent with our societal goals? This might be especially important in areas which are out with individual control, or areas where voluntary measures have been unable to achieve the change that we as a society want to achieve. The fact is that societal rules can be our friends if they help us to enact things we want to achieve but which we struggle to do on our own. We could, for example, frame rules which harness food promotion for public good. I, for one, would be rather pleased if there was a rule to prevent chocolate pushers at the checkout. It's a good example of how we make life more difficult for people than it needs to be. I don't want to be forced into having to make a decision about whether I do or don't want a bar of chocolate when I only went into the shop for a newspaper. Rules which command public support and which then create a level playing field for companies can help good health to become good for business too because the most progressive companies will benefit the most. Just to close, I guess I do want to remind us that food and eating is a really important part of the way we live. Certainly one of the greatest pleasures in my life is cooking and eating with family and friends. We're sociable creatures and our eating habits are shaped by social norms. We learn to like what we like, but that can and does change in response both to the environment in which we find ourselves and the culture in which we live. My point is that at the moment, we're expecting a lot of individuals if we expect that they need to take full responsibility for making healthier choices, while elsewhere we're condoning a food system that provides and promotes the less healthy. So what I hope to have shown you this evening is that research has provided the signpost to a better diet. The question is whether we, as a society, are prepared to take the decisive steps it suggests to turn the tide of diet-related ill health. We're now more than 50 years on from the Royal College of Physicians report on smoking, and we like to look back and celebrate how far we've come in reducing the harm caused by tobacco. But what I want you to do now is to look forward and to see that we can do some of the same if we're serious about improving diet too. Thank you. <laughs>